The Nokia N-Gage. If you've never heard of it, this video game playing cell phone is famous in the gaming community for two things. One, being a horrible failure. And two, for making you look like you're holding a taco to your head whenever you used it. It really did look so, so stupid. Plenty of folks think they know why it failed, but what if I said there was more to the story? What if I told you the N-Gage failed at one specific point so immensely that it triggered a cataclysmic chain reaction dooming the brand for all eternity? And nobody noticed but me. Folks, I've discovered something I've never seen anyone else discuss. You won't be reading this on Wikipedia from a combination of my own personal experiences along with tons of mind-melting research. What I found changes the story of the N-Gage and how it came to an unfortunate end. Get yourself ready and hold your N-Gages tight. It's time for us to rewrite history. Back in the day, I didn't hear about the N-Gage from a magazine or a TV ad or even an excited friend. No, I stumbled onto it completely by accident. Once upon a time, in the year 2003, I walked into my local game store and spied something. Something new. A lone interactive display pushed off into the corner. Nobody in the shop paid attention to this foreign pillar or the device latched to it, but my interest was piqued. And on approach, I came face to face with a brand new handheld game console. Now, I like to think of myself, even back then, as a massive video game geek. I was in the gaming scene loop. I read the magazines, watched the shows, and paid attention to news on gaming websites. I lived and breathed gaming. Or so I thought. Because for all my attempts at being in the know with all things games, I had no idea what that shield-shaped system in front of me was. Engage? What the heck's an engage? My expectations lowered. I leaned in to check the handheld's teeny tiny screen. In my mind, nothing could rival the then current reigning handheld, the Game Boy Advance. Certainly not a gadget that hadn't blipped my constant games knowledge radar. But then I saw something remarkable, something Nintendo's advanced pocket device had merely dabbled with. 3D graphics, full 3D graphics. How was this possible? Every other portable had struggled with the prospect of 3D. How did this tiny little device materialize unannounced and output polygonal worlds? Who was responsible? To my shock, to my amazement, the answer was Nokia. Nokia? Okay, so yeah, that's not exactly a name discussed much today. And for some of you, well, you may not have even heard of that company before. But I assure you, from the 90s into the 2000s, Nokia was a pillar of the tech market. Synonymous with cell phones, but with video games, not so much. I mean, outside of this. Snake! a game that managed to slither onto pretty much every Nokia device. So maybe you knew them as the Snake People? But as we mentioned before, the title of Supreme Portable Gaming Overlord went to Nintendo. And in 2001, they released the Game Boy Advance to immediate success. But here was Nokia, challenging the Mario company on their own turf. A brave move to say the least. They must have really believed the N-Gage had a chance at toppling the Big N's handheld dominance. So, did it? I mean, no, come on, of course it didn't. Let me introduce you to the first game I saw on the N-Gage all those years ago, Tony Hawk's Pro Skater. Now, just as I am today, back in 2003, I was a fan of the Tony Hawk's Pro Skater series. At the time, there had been a number of great games released on multiple platforms. Unfortunately, when it came to portable versions of the series, typically, they weren't one-to-one -one with what you'd find on more powerful systems. You can debate the quality of these releases in their presentations. I think they're good, but there's no denying that these were not the same games we were playing at home. I mean, look at that. It's a huge difference. It's not important polygonal 3D, and this is a dedicated game console. With that under our belt, let's take a look at the N-Gage port. Full 3D graphics. And not just that, the N-Gage version includes the original game soundtrack, not meaty reproductions. It also includes all the levels from the original Tony Hawk's Pro Skater release. And wait, what's this? A selection of levels from its sequel? A port that goes beyond the full original? On a cell phone? How is this real? 
incredible. They were able to replicate the at-home Tony Hawk's Pro Skater experience on something that fit in my pocket. This was not even remotely close to what we've been seeing on the Game Boy Advance, which, while displaying 3D assets and experiences in some of its library, didn't look nearly as good as this Engage launch title. Nokia's device felt like a generational leap over its competition. Now, yes, Pro Skater 1 was four years old by the time the Engage came out, and there were multiple entries in the mainline series at this point, but I'm amazed how well this title holds up to this day. It's the best portable version of the first Pro Skater game. This isn't a remaster or a remake, it's a port, and portable ports of 3D games at this time? Unheard of. As if that wasn't impressive enough, the same company responsible for this release, IdeaWorks 3D, created another amazing port for the Engage, the iconic 3D action adventure title, Tomb Raider. Again, this is mind-blowing stuff. How is this real? Tomb Raider is running exactly as you would hope it would run. The only difference I can find is that there are some pre-rendered video sequences missing from the original releases. And Laura Croft is wearing a different outfit you wouldn't have seen in the original. It looks like they pulled inspiration from 2003's Tomb Raider The Angel of Darkness, which was the most recent entry at the time. But make no mistake, despite the tweaks and omissions, the core Tomb Raider experience is right here. Puzzles, action, and all. Something that can't be said of the Game Boy Advance Lara Croft releases, Tomb Raider The Prophecy, and Tomb Raider Legend. These 2D graphical downgrades don't really nail the feel and formula of the original home releases. IdeaWorks 3D did an incredible job bringing big home console adventuring to a smaller screen. And get this, not only did IdeaWorks 3D release Tony Hawk's Pro Skater and Tomb Raider to the N-Gage, but they also released another accurate 3D port as well, Pandemonium, a fantasy platformer originally released to the Sony PlayStation. That's three games, all polygonal home console ports tuned for a handheld, all released in October 2003 by the exact same company all during the launch month of the N-Gage. So the N-Gage had a promising proposition from a games perspective. Unfortunately, the system never really found an audience. But why? Why did it not catch on? Why did nobody talk about the wizardry I experienced at that N-Gage kiosk way back when? Well, most people would blame the design of the device, and for good reason. The N-Gage features this circular directional pad along with an overwhelmingly complicated number pad. These buttons might be good to make a phone call with, maybe, but they do not look or feel good for gaming. The entire number pad, that's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and nine are all used in game along with the hashtag button. That's 10 buttons, 10, on the front of the right side of the device, all used to play Tomb Raider. That's a lot of buttons. Oh, and that's just the setup for one game. Multiple titles have different control layouts, meaning that in N-Gage's grand gaming scheme, you have to use different configurations of more than a dozen buttons to play its library. This may surprise you as well, there are no shoulder buttons on the N-Gage, which had become standard on home consoles for years by this point. The Game Boy Advance, well, it utilized them to great effect. See, now you could use your index fingers in combination with your thumbs to control several inputs all at once with very little hand movement. Engage, however, all these buttons, all with one thumb, super dumb. So the games looked good, but they'd been ported to a device that lacked the controls to make them, well, playable. This really didn't help sell the N-Gage. But then, and I can't stress this enough, the thing I found the most irritating with the system is how you change out the game cards. And you're never gonna believe this. It's embarrassing. To switch out games, you need to take out the battery. They thought it was smart to have you take the backplate off, take the battery out, replace the game card, put the battery back in, and reconnect the backplate every single time you wanted to switch games. It's pure, complete madness. Considering the only major competition for the N-Gage had you simply yank out cartridges from an exposed slot in the back, no one had a reason to put up with this terribly designed hardware. And not only is changing games on a GBA super fast, so is playing them. Boot up is quick. Just four seconds and you're into the game. The N-Gage, however, starts up a cell phone operating system that takes multiple times the length to get a player into a game. Once you are through all that and have started up a title, you 
unfortunately find loading screens in multiple games, something you really didn't have with the Game Boy Advance titles of its time. Quick gaming on the go? Not so easy with this bad boy. Less than a year after the N-Gage launched, they did release an updated device called the N-Gage QD, which gave it a real honest-to-goodness card slot. Yippee! You no longer need to disassemble the console to switch games, but it's still not as easy as a Game Boy Advance. You need to quit the software properly first before swapping cards, so it still managed to be bad. And also, this one bugs me a lot. No independent volume controls. You need to adjust volume inside the game on the main menu or possibly in the settings. It changes from game to game and varies in adjustment levels as well. Some give you proper leveling controls, others just let you switch to single word options like low, medium, or high. Isn't that fun? It's like a little mystery hunt every time you need to adjust the volume. Physical volume buttons and dials were a thing before the N-Gage was released, Nokia. I know this because your dang phones had them. These things have a billion buttons, but they didn't want to put in volume rockers? Why? But no matter which model of N-Gage you got, you still had the same awful screen. And that's another big problem. Not only is it a terrible aspect ratio for most video games found on any other platform, but it's also small. I mean, take a look at this thing. It's got a screen that's about one inch smaller than the GBA. And I mean, that's not good for portable gaming. You need something a little bit bigger than that. It's hard to appreciate revolutionary portable 3D graphics when you can barely see them. As an example, Ghost Recon Jungle Storm. Into the distance, a character you're supposed to take down might become the size of one teeny pixel. Frustrating. But I'd argue the aspect ratio actually does way more of a disservice to this machine. The portrait layout of the screen means that games lose visibility on the left and right. You have a very narrow view of the game world, unless you really like looking at ceilings, because you'll be getting plenty of that. This kind of aspect ratio might be very good for vertical shoot-em-ups, but unfortunately, the N-Gage doesn't have many of those, so it's kind of a missed opportunity all around. Developers never seem to embrace this unique hardware. That is to say, we got a lot of releases in familiar genres that don't really mesh with the N-Gage's funky aspect ratio. For example, a 3D fighting game called One, an isometric perspective role-playing game called Requiem of Hell, a naval fighting strategy game taking place around the 18th century called High Seas. A real-time tactics game called Pathway to Glory that also happened to get a sequel called Pathway to Glory Ikuza Islands. And many others, most of which you'll only find on the N-Gage. Unfortunately, almost every single game is heavily inspired by pre-existing franchises. Some more obvious than others. One is clearly just a bootleg Tekken. Requiem of Hell is so Diablo, it's sinful. High Seas is a photocopy of Advance Wars from Nintendo, and Pathway to Glory is a dead ringer for Commandos. But don't get me wrong, this doesn't mean these games are throwaway knockoffs. In most instances, they feature fully voiced performances, great graphics, unique stories, and slightly animated cutscenes. But at the end of the day, these games are attempting to be portable or copycat versions of pre-existing franchises. Sometimes that means the gameplay doesn't translate well to portability, with these controls and this screen. Believe it or not, the system even got ports of games from its primary handheld competition, the Game Boy Advance. One such title is this game, Sonic N. This title was previously released on the Game Boy Advance as Sonic Advance, a pretty good game, just not on the end gauge. And why? Well, there's several massive reasons. First off, using a 2D game to sell your 3D portable doesn't exactly make your system look like the generational powerhouse leap that Nokia probably wanted. But worse is that freaking aspect ratio. Look, you can't play Sonic like this. You can't see two in-game inches in front of the guy. There's a button that fixes the aspect ratio and puts a four x three window in the middle of the screen. If you thought the screen was tiny before, this puts the Game Boy Micro to shame. Other GB 
GBA games ported to the Engage suffered in similar ways. But you may be asking, what would happen if you took a series people knew and made a totally unique entry just for the Engage? Well, wonder no more, because you get this. The Elder Scrolls Travels Shadow Key. That's right, the one and only Elder Scrolls series has a unique game on the Engage. It's a full 3D first person experience. Now, I'm not gonna tell you that this is an amazing game because it's not. You've got a story, you've got cutscenes, you've got on foot travel across a 3D world filled with dungeons and other landmarks. But the combat, puzzles, level designs, and pretty much everything about the game isn't so hot. It feels far clunkier than its console contemporary, Morrowind. and it's unsurprisingly not as expansive. No matter where you are in the game, there is an extremely low draw distance, and that basically means you can't see very far in front of you. So indoors or outdoors, it always feels like you're in a cave. This is a clear attempt at trying to capture the essence of Elder Scrolls portably, but it doesn't stick the landing. Instead of leaning into the restrictions of the hardware, the ambition of the project leads to a poor overall gameplay experience. Not everyone was capable of figuring out how to make their games work on the end gauge. The game selection, it was all over the place. You had dead, accurate ports of big games next to very poor ones. Portable ports that were worse than the original. And games that were unique to the end gauge, but were lesser clones of other franchises. You win! And there were some games that didn't pull inspiration from known properties and seemed original in design too. But that doesn't mean they're good. To talk about this next game, I think I'm going to get a little help. Hello? Hey Adam, you got a minute? I'm talking to you on a device that needs to be disassembled and reassembled every time I don't want to play the lesser port of a Sonic game anymore. Good point. Limerati is a racing game developed by Bugbear Entertainment and published by Nokia exclusively for the Engage in 2003. You may remember us talking about a series called Flat Out a while back? Well, this game was created by the same people, nestled between the releases of the first and second Flat Out titles. Limerati is a special little game that mostly went under the radar upon release, but for those who were into the Engage at the time, well, they claimed good things. That's right. The game was received quite well critically. Heck, I IGN considered it one of the top games ever released on the platform. So, of course, we figured we'd sit down and play through the whole dang thing. It's time to see if all that glitters is gold in Glimmerati. First impressions! Hmm, this perspective... It isn't doing it for me. Why are we up above and slightly behind the vehicle? It's like we're plopped in a helicopter chasing the car. Worst of all, despite seeing a bit of what's in front of us, it's still hard to anticipate and react to what's heading our way. Can we, uh, change the camera angle? Hmm, let's see. Tappa tappa tappa. Uh, no? Despite the many available buttons on the Engage system, none of them change the camera angle. Shockingly, Glimmerati uses way less buttons than you'd probably think. Outside of the D-pad, the game only makes use of buttons 5, 6, 7, and 9. 5 is Accelerate, 6 is a Nitro Boost, 9 is a Map, and 7 is a Brake Reverse Hybrid button. You're telling me that despite the player having access to double-digit face button inputs, they apply multiple actions to the same button? I guess they must have done that to simplify the control. You know, make the game way easier to play. Except it isn't. I can barely keep our tiny car on the road. Look at this. The steering is incredibly sloppy. We're slipping all over the place, especially on major turns. Yeah, the muddy feeling veering mixed with the low visibility camera angle, two ingredients that simply do not make for good racing. You'd think that the aspect ratio of this system would actually work with this driving gameplay, but without camera controls, you're never sure what's about to smack head on into your vehicle. And since some of the levels are in semi open world stages, you'll be needing to tap the map button a lot to figure out where you're supposed to go. Oh, very small screen, very little real estate to put in a mini-map. Ah, uh, nice. Great way to totally clip the flow of momentum. Well, okay, so the game's not winning us over in the gameplay department. But still, this game seemed to be highly recommended as an N-Gage release. Is there something we're missing here? How's the story? Brain dead. Sometimes, the best things in life happen by accident. That would literally be the case with my late uncle. Just prior to getting killed in a freak jet ski accident, 
He made me his sole heir. Insultingly brain dead. Okay, d don't get me wrong, they tried to weave a story into this thing. Uh, they tried to introduce a bunch of different characters, but everything and everyone is poorly written. Hey, I bought nice lodge in Valley. I throw a big party dad tonight. Want to find out how good you really are? See if you can beat me on my favorite course. They all kind of look like Bond villains getting ready to go out and hit the club. Or stock photos that pop up when you type glamorous constipation into a search engine. Anyway, you're forced to interact with all these dynamically posed dingbats in order to progress through the game. I have an offer you can't refuse, as you seem to have an exquisite taste for a feminine beauty. Shockingly, for a portable game, every line of character dialogue has a full voiceover performance. Every. Single. One. Hi. You gotta commend the folks behind Glimmerati for putting time and effort into reading lines like these. If you see my wife there, give her my apologies for not being able to attend myself. I'm uh, having a very important meeting with my financial advisor. You could show up at the fashion show tonight. All the important people are there. You can use my invitation. I'm hiring myself another assistant tonight. I think someone owes the estate of Sean Connery a royalty check. Oh, you ain't kidding. This is supposed to capture the ritz and glamour of an elite group of car enthusiasts. At least, I think it's supposed to. Hi there, pretty boy. I'm Jenna. But instead, everything feels like a crappy reality show with terrible interpersonal relationships dotted throughout. Play with fire, and you'd better prepare to deal with the consequences. You'll struggle hard to focus on these vapid personalities and their stories, because you'll be too distracted by their gigantic 1980s brick cell phones they're using instead of modern phones. You know, like the N-Gage, the thing you're holding in your hands to play this racing catastrophe. I typically don't want to see product placement in video games, but if there was ever a time you needed one, this is it. There is an attempt to play with your expectations once or twice, however, most twists on gameplay are better at irritating the player than delighting them with something different. There's a mission where you have to head to a special location on the map. All done while attempting to avoid the police who will arrest you on site if they catch you speeding. And why would you speed? Well, because you have a strict time limit, which leads to terrible cat and mouse gameplay that burns your fingers. There's a mission where you're forced to drive on ice. If the controls were bad before, uh, this is even slippier. And again, like the last mission, all this has to be done in a time limit. If you slide off the course at all, you fail. And believe us, they demand perfection to stay in the lines. There's a mission where you drive a rocket prototype vehicle. I have just completed the prototype for a jet propulsion vehicle fit for mass production. Which sounds amazing, but you go so fast, it's hard to know when you have upcoming turns. Oh, and they took away any indicators of any turns in the future. A different perspective would sure as heck help here, don't you think? You often have to repeat events and races multiple times just to squeeze out a win constantly. It's a punishing game. A shocking revelation from the folks who made the first two very good flat-out games. If this game didn't exist only on N-Gage, maybe it might have been better on something else. But when it's locked as an exclusive on this horrible hardware, it's really hard to distinguish what is worse, the game or having to play it on the cursed N-Gage. Like we said at the start of this little diatribe, Glimmerati came out in 2005. Now, you're probably thinking there wasn't a good example of a 3D behind the vehicle or first-person racing game that these devs could pull inspiration from, right? Uh, not on a handheld, at least. Well, if we simply ignored Mario Kart on GBA, since it used flat level designs, we could always look at V-Rally 3 with full 3D levels released in 2002. Yeah, don't think for a moment we're not aware the old GBA could produce reasonable 3D graphics. Sure, it wasn't common, but it did happen. But hey, an aging portable console from Nintendo might not be fair game to compare against this N-Gage release from 2005. So let's just point to another N-Gage release. Three, two, one. Colin McRae Rally 2005, which looks amazing. And check this out, multiple camera angles. And look, the game is so richly detailed that when you switch to the front hood camera, you can actually hear rubble hitting the wheel wells of the car. 
Whoa, for a portable at this time? That's really impressive. Oh, and to really kick this comparison into high gear, despite this game being called Colin McRae Rally 2005, it actually came out in 2004. You know what that means? This game is older than Glimmerati. Who ported Colin McRae Rally to the N-Gage? Believe it or not, the same folks that ported Tony Hawk's Pro Skater, Tomb Raider, and Pandemonium. They just kept pumping out greatness. Well, greatness restricted by the N-Gage straitjacket of platform pain. Speaking of pain, what's our final analysis on Glimmerati? Ah, there you are. Its gameplay spins out into the bleachers with sloppy controls and a terrible lone camera angle. Its story and characters are eye-rollingly executed. Yeah, ladies. Lots of ladies. This reminded me of my latest movie. Catfight 3. Its tacked on gameplay twists had us ticked off. Heck, we can just simplify the whole dang thing and say it's just. Uh, hello? Jane? Jane? Oh, 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 Adam, Adam, hello, hello? Uh, I, I took out the battery because I wanted to switch out the game. And I forgot we were on an active call. This here is why you don't use the original N-Gage. This thing sucks. Shane? 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 Games like Glimmerati did not get people invested in N-Gage. In fact, nothing did. In my entire life, the only person I know that actually owned an N-Gage when it was new was Adam Korlick. Adam, say hi. Hi, I'm Adam Korlick, standing in front of a statue of Abraham Lincoln because I'm an American. And yes, I am the only person he knows who actually did have a Nokia N-Gage when it was relevant. That really happened. My mom forced it on me. That's true, that really did occur. And I still have it. Even though I was interested when I first saw it, there was one thing that stopped me dead in my tracks. The price. Infamously, Nokia announced the price of the N-Gage at an E3 presentation in 2003. Did they think that would be entertaining? I guess it was supposed to make the N-Gage cool and attractive, but look at that tum-tum. Look at it. 299 US dollars in 2003. That was unheard of for a handheld. The people in the audience right now are industry folks, like journalists and people that need to actually sign up the N-Gage to sell at stores. If you saw this, would you trust the product? Or would you think the company was completely out of their minds? Games like Super Monkey Ball, Rayman 3 and Sonic N were all ports of Game Boy Advance titles. They looked just as good on GBA and played better with the proper screen and controls. Gamers could buy all those games and a GBA system and spend less than they would on a single N-Gage system at retail. Do you see how that could be a problem? I mean, sure, this console has the best portable version of Tony Hawk I've ever seen. But at that price point in 2003, why would I have wanted to play that on this little console? when I could have done this. Tony Hawk's Pro Skater 2X had released two years prior on Xbox, and it, in my opinion, was the perfect version of the game. It includes all levels from not only the first game, but the second as well, along with a bunch of bonus levels that could not be found in either of the first two releases. And by the time N-Gage came out in 2003, the price of the Xbox had come down considerably, meaning you could probably buy the Xbox and Tony Hawk's Pro Skater 2X for less than the cost of the N-Gage alone. And remember that Elder Scrolls game we talked about that wasn't quite Morrowind? Well, why not just get Morrowind on Xbox? It's the exact same issue you've got with Tony Hawk. In fact, many of these games on N-Gage have better versions of the same games or what inspired them for cheaper on tons of better platforms. Let me repeat that. A full-on home console with better controls and graphics, plus a copy of a game costs less than the N-Gage itself. That $299 price point on the N-Gage was a huge problem no matter how you cut it. Even when or if they knock the price down by 100 smackers, you're still saving money by getting a console in most instances. That stings. And let us not forget, the N-Gage is a cell phone. Believe it or not, it had online features and multiplayer. But as a cell phone, that means you'd need a cell phone plan to access most of this stuff on the go. Which means to use some of these features, you'd need to be paying a monthly fee.
Engage. It's the console that keeps on taking your money. Portable consoles at the time needed to cost far less than home consoles. Otherwise, they wouldn't move. So you can clearly see the Game Boy Advance made a lot more sense as a gaming portable in a head-to-head -head match with the N-Gage. But a year after its launch, the N-Gage went up against far more serious opposition. Sony's PlayStation Portable and Nintendo DS. Impossible competition. N-Gage what? That 3D advantage, poof, gone. The PSP had a bigger screen, a screen so big you could almost fit an entire N-Gage inside of it. PSP had better graphics and controls. Comparing that Colin McRae Rally 2005 we previously gushed about back to back with the PSP release? And six right in the cave, five right over bump. No contest. And while the DS didn't compete with the raw horsepower of the PSP's graphics and screen, it offered a unique way to interact with games. Two screens, one of which being a touchscreen. That became pretty much a highlight of the system, becoming the most successful handheld gaming platform of its generation. So Nokia saw the writing on the wall and discontinued the N-Gage in 2006, but they held on to that name. So with very little competition for gaming on the cell phone market at least, they decided to make the N-Gage service, but we're gonna call it N-Gage 2.0. Nokia used the N-Gage name to foster a range of Nokia-made cell phones that happened to play video games. But don't mistake this with old N-Gage hardware. No, no, because this is a straight up cell phone and it has software bundled inside of it that gives you the ability to download games. No more cartridges or anything like that. Anyone that owned any of these Nokia cell phones had this ability. That means that anyone that had this could be a potential N-Gage gamer. Folks wouldn't need to go out and buy a specific piece of gaming hardware. They just naturally buy a new phone and oops, they just bought a gaming device. Believe me, N-Gage 2.0 had games. They brought back Pandemonium, which you may recall had a port on the original N-Gage. No, this isn't Pandemonium 2, it's just Pandemonium again. There are also sequels to N-Gage specific games like System Rush and One. Do you remember that fighting game that ripped off Tekken? Well, it's back. That's right, one, two. But it's just called one again, because I imagine calling a game two would have been weird, though no weirder than calling a game one sequel, which is how the developer labels it on their website. By the way, there isn't even just one game called one. There's also a one for the PlayStation one, which is a totally different one. Anyways, not sure why a sequel exists if no one played the first one. Oh, that's hurting my brain. Speaking of sequels nobody asked for, the N-Gage 2.0 actually offered its user base a sequel to a game just about everybody played at one point or another, a game we've already touched on, Snake. That's right, if Nintendo has Super Mario, if Sega has Sonic the Hedgehog, Nokia has Snake. Snake itself was a much, much older game that didn't originate with Nokia cell phones. This is Nibbler. It came out in 1982 in arcades. It's not even the first snake-like game out there. So Nokia really didn't originate the snake getting longer as it eats genre of video game. But they sure as heck felt like they could improve it, so they released Snakes for the N-Gage in 2005. That's Snakes with an S at the end. It's kind of fun to play for a little bit, but gets repetitive very quickly, very much like the original. No one seemed to pay attention to this title at launch. So when I found out they made another sequel for N-Gage 2.0 called Snake Subsonic, I was floored. This release feels like a slightly tweaked and fleshed out version of Snakes. But at the end of the day, who was asking for these Snake sequels? N-Gage 2.0 also housed a number of bad mobile phone games you could find on other cell phones, like Star Wars The Force Unleashed. This is an awful experience through and through. When you compare it to the PSP release, it's like you're looking at titles multiple generations apart, even though the N-Gage 2.0 capable phones happen to be newer than the PSP by several years. Of all the games I played on N-Gage 2.0, most weren't really noteworthy. There was a Resident Evil game called Resident Evil Degeneration, and while it does work, it's not better than the iOS version that came out the next year. It's based on an animated Resident Evil movie, so if you're desperate to learn its story, save your time trying to play this thing and just watch that instead. 
In my opinion, there is only one standout experience for the N-Gage 2.0. It's a unique entry in a classic Konami series launched specifically for gaming cell phones. And despite the bad controls and awful hardware, I muscled through it and completed the whole thing because I just had to. Metal Gear Solid Mobile. I've played virtually every single game in the Metal Gear franchise. So the idea that there was a Metal Gear game out there that I hadn't played, ooh, it itched my brain like no other. One thing I can tell you about this game straight up is that it is not canonical or integral to the series story whatsoever. In fact, this game was developed by IdeaWorks 3D, who have now changed their name to IdeaWorks Game Studio. Again, that's the same studio that brought games like Tomb Raider and Tony Hawk's Pro Skater to the end gauge. Long time Metal Gear lead Hideo Kojima acted as a supervisor, like he has done with other side projects in the series. Don't go in expecting much of a story. It's got one, but it's blander than tap water. The game looks and plays a lot like Metal Gear Solid 2. Plenty of sneaking, plenty of combat, use weapons, pick up items, hide in cardboard boxes, you get the picture. Using an in-game camera, you can take pictures of objects and sample the color of them to change Snake's camo. One fun added option, you can also use the physical camera on your phone to take pictures of real-world objects, sampling their color as well. While this is a neat feature, you can literally play the entire game without using it, so it's kind of pointless. Plus, the camo system being used has some problems when hiding in plain sight. It looks, well, a little unrealistic. You can complete the game in around two hours, give or take. That's pretty short, and it doesn't really incentivize replayability. Despite its shortcomings, Metal Gear Solid Mobile could have been a highlight of N-Gage 2.0, but, uh, the PSP already had seen the release of a few Metal Gear games by the time this came out in 2008. Comparing Metal Gear Solid Portable Ops on PSP to this, well, for many, it wasn't even a contest. Can it even be a contest if players were blissfully unaware? Metal Gear Solid Mobile flew completely under the radar, much like N-Gage's reinvigorated 2.0 push. The PSP and Nintendo DS were still far better gaming devices despite being older hardware. And unfortunately, those systems weren't all Nokia had to worry about. N-Gage 2.0 and the Nokia company itself was about to meet the biggest threat they would ever face. You see, N-Gage 2.0 launched in 2008, just a year after Apple launched a little something called the iPhone. Saying the iPhone started phasing out old-style cell phones is putting things lightly. Its release signaled that touchscreen smartphones were the new standard. Nokia's now out-of-date handsets? They were left behind. N-Gage 2.0 didn't stand a chance. Nokia shut down the N-Gage service just a year later in 2009 and permanently ended the N-Gage line of, well, anything. So, we've talked about the hardware, the games, the prices, all the reasons why the N-Gage didn't work. And it's possible you've heard some of this before. But when we began this little trot down Nokia handheld memory lane, I promised you we were going to be redefining the history of the system. And I think it's finally time to share what we found. It goes all the way back to Nokia at E3 in 2003. Now, E3 isn't really relevant anymore, but in 2003, it was still a crucial trade show to the gaming industry. It's its goal at the time was to be an event that would allow participants to share information about upcoming hardware and software across the video game's landscape. The deals made at this show determined what products were hitting which shelves for the next year. Just as important, E3 was a great place to inform journalists from all over the world about what products and games a company was working on. And this point is incredibly important, because that press coverage is how consumers found out about and got hyped for said products. The only view the public had into E3 back then was through the journalists covering the event, so we only knew what they chose to report on. Impressing them was important, and if Nokia couldn't convince physical store representatives to carry their N-Gage line, well, that too could impact the consumer's ability to know of the product's existence. So, how did things go for Nokia? <laughs> Not good. Following that was N-Gage, which by far was the worst, most ludicrous waste of time. Uh, in terms of E3, Nokia has no idea what they're doing. And it's very obvious for trying to sit through that uh, press conference that they're just clueless. Um, as far as the games go, the, the software quality is kind of sketchy right now. The 3D stuff, 
appears to be really unoptimized. We're getting uh, sluggish frame rates. The process by which you have to go through to uh, swap games. There's been a lot of stink made about this so far. You have to take the, you have to basically field strip your end gauge to change games. This power up process actually takes around 30 seconds to complete. And from there, the game doesn't actually automatically start. You have to go all the way into the main menu, use the D-pad here, the rocker, they're calling it. You scroll down to the game, which is at the bottom of the list of items, and then you push the rocker in, and then it will load the game. And uh, many of the games actually have loading times associated with them as well. So all this kind of adds up to uh, a pretty big hassle. The word carried back from their E3 2003 presentation was that the games on the end gauge performed terribly. They looked bad with near unplayable frame rates and poor button response. And this was a common complaint across the board. The system seemed like it just didn't play games well. But wait, really? I mean, I played a ton of N-Gage software for this review, and I wasn't seeing something inherently unplayable. When I was a kid and first got my hands on an N-Gage, I thought it was a really cool experience. With a few flaws, sure, but I didn't see the problems echoed out after the E3 showcase. So I decided to do some digging, and this is what I found. A digital press kit disc given out by Nokia at E3. On it, there are several clips of the system's Tomb Raider release. But check this out. This clip, it's running poorly. In fact, it seems like the frame rate is cut in half. What this shows is that there was something wrong with games playing on original hardware when E3 rolled around. And that's not the only weird footage I found. Here's video coverage from Edge Magazine and Gamer.tv. Look, the featured gameplay, same problem poor performance. It looks like Nokia had a big problem. They didn't try to hide it, but maybe they should have. Maybe the games were early versions or the hardware was still being tweaked. I have no way to know. But the game shown off, the games played and demoed, the footage Nokia themselves handed to media outlets did not represent the system that launched. Do you get why that's a problem? Nokia themselves dealt an early death blow to the N-Gage's reputation long before the system got into gamers' hands. It's wild. Typically, companies overpromise on software and hardware, showing pre-rendered videos or screenshots that don't represent final releases. Nokia somehow managed to do the opposite. They failed to showcase what the N-Gage was actually capable of at one of the most important gaming events of the time. No one was excited to hype up a game experience like this, the system's lukewarm showcase and performance led to mostly unenthusiastic coverage. And when E3 was over, so was any hype that could have been built for the N-Gage, likely why I never caught wind of the device before it released. And don't forget, it wasn't just the press at that event. Representatives of physical retailers were no doubt at the expo witnessing the unit's poor performance as well, tummy price and all. They probably thought that nobody would buy it. And really, can you blame them? That box would have taken up valuable shelf space shelf space that could have gone to any number of other video game companies. And this box represented one of the most expensive handheld video game devices of all time. So of course the stores wouldn't buy into this. And back in the early 2000s, a physical in-store presence was key to a product success. Remember that N-Gage display kiosk I saw all the way back at the start of this story? That's how kids typically found out about new hardware or games back then. If they were not reading video game magazines or online articles, they were discovering things in local stores. The store I went to featured the only demonstration unit I ever saw in the entire city I lived in. Look, Nokia tried to get people interested. I mean, they made their own trade magazine called N-Gage Insider, a real magazine they sent around for industry folks to learn about the N-Gage and what the company planned to do for the future. But it was just too late. The device floundered in gaming's biggest spotlight event. So why would anyone care about this? And as for magazine ads you might find for the N-Gage, don't even get me started. I mean, look at this. How long did it take you to realize that this is an ad for Sonic N? The only picture of Sonic is this tiny little blur inside these small screen grabs. This is one of the most popular characters in all of video games, and they chose to not put him front and center in the advertisement for this game. Nokia, this wasn't the time to play coy. And if you want to point to even more product and messaging issues, look at these. Nokia offered a variety of phones that looked very similar to the N-Gage handheld that had no N-Gage. 
10-gauge software compatibility. Talk about confusing. How would an average consumer know the difference? Good things have changed for Nokia if they had showcased the right gameplay at the right time and offered spectators the real retail N-Gage experience? With the cost of the hardware and all the other issues we brought up? No, it probably still would have been a rough time. I mean, that battery thing to switch out games? Yikes. But maybe with more public interest from the start, they could have drummed up a fighting chance. If N-Gage had a stronger launch, they could have seen more publisher and developer support. They could have had a real audience of gamers to help build their gaming brand. N-Gage hardware could have evolved. Maybe it could have led to an early take on smartphone gaming that could have positively impacted the very future of Nokia. But that didn't happen. Any ballooning N-Gage engagement was pierced and deflated by one poorly handled E3 event. You can blame Nintendo, you can blame Sony, and you can even try and blame Apple all you want for Nokia's failure of the N-Gage platform. But at the end of the day, it was Nokia themselves that screwed up everything at the most crucial moments. Even though nobody recognized that before we made this video, it is a factor in what ended up being the N-Gage failure. Shane? Shane? Shane! Shane! <laughs> <laughs>